All right, then we can get started here. First off, I'm send, putting a link to the handout in the chat box for those of you who didn't get it yet. The chat box is open, by the way. I will be answering questions at the end of my presentation. So just keep that in mind, but you can feel free to talk amongst yourselves if you'd like. Uh, tonight's presentation is called Genealogy Using Directories to Research Your Ancestors. First of all, we acknowledge that the Boston Public Library's central library stands on land that was once a water-based ecosystem, providing sustenance for the indigenous Massachusetts people and is a place which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange among nations. We are committed to land acknowledgements for all locations at which we operate. We reaffirm this commitment to set the context for our planning, deliberations, and public engagement will take place from the spirit of welcome and respect found in our motto, free to all. So for those of you who don't know me, if you're new to these presentations, I'm Jesse Wheeler. I'm the genealogy specialist here at the BPL. I work in the research services department at the Central Library. So because we are in Boston, a lot of what we're gonna be talking about is Boston-based things. I'm gonna just kinda, for those of you who are just joining, I'm gonna pop a link to the handout in the chat right there. So a couple of other things, this program is being recorded and I will be sending a link to everyone once it is ready on our YouTube channel. So stay tuned for that. We'll also, everyone will also be getting a follow-up email tomorrow that will have a link to my slides as well as to the handout in case you didn't get that. So you don't need to worry about writing a bunch of things down. You'll be getting all this information again in an email and you'll be able to watch the recording, which hopefully won't take too long to get up there, but you never know. Our AV folks are very, very busy. So what are we going to be covering today? So. <coughs> So there's a few different there's so there's two main categories of directories that we're going to be talking about today that are the most useful in genealogy research and I'm sorry you'll have to excuse uh, if I have a frog in my throat it is allergy season and I have them so I do apologize and I will try not to clear my throat too too much. So we have two main categories of directories that we're going to be discussing today. Those are going to be city directories and society directories. Some of you may have already used city directories. They are pretty well used, but some of you may not have. Society directories aren't quite as widely used as city directories, and I've been trying to fix that. I think they're a wonderful resource. We're also going to be talking about a few other types of directories, including telephone directories, the Boston list of residents, and other list of residents. Over here on the right, you can see there's an image of the title page for the 1858 to Boston City Directory, which I think you can probably tell why I chose that particular one. It has lots of lovely illustrations around it. But that was a nice little accent to what we're talking about. So first, city directories. This image is from one of the first city directories. I think it might actually be the first Boston directory ever published, which was in 1790. You can see here the very first listing is Samuel Adams. And yes, it is that Samuel Adams, the one after whom the brewery was na named and one of the founding fathers. He was listed in the city directory. I thought that was pretty cool. So what are city directories? City directories, they are these are commercially published listings of the residents and businesses in a particular city, town, or area. So that's something important to remember. They are commercially published. They are not published by the government. So they are not official government records. They are commercial records. And why I say sometimes it's an area, sometimes you'll have places where there's a bunch of small towns and they'll all be listed in the same guide. We have a few examples of that in New England. So in general, what they will contain are the name, basically the names and addresses that you'll have that definitely. And in many cases, uh, especially if you get to later directories, it will include the occupations and sometimes uh, where they worked, the individuals that are listed in them. So, and if you're really lucky, it may also include the dates of death of people who were in them previously. So I have found a few dates of death for folks this way by looking in the city directories. It do, they don't put that in for everyone. It really depends on whether or not their surviving family members notified them 
that such and such so and so had died and what the date of death was but it can be really useful sometimes that's the there's been a couple instances where that was the easiest place I could find it it wasn't anywhere else the other thing it might also include again this isn't for everyone it depends on whether or not the person notified the publishers it could have information about when someone left an area and where they went to so sometimes that'll say so and so moved west to California or so and so moved to Cambridge or so and so moved to Springfield which one it might say right, that's a little Springfield joke for those of you who are aware of how many there are all right we go so a few other good things to know about the city directories especially early on the directories are basically only list men so that's for many years it was only men women were only included if they were considered the head of their household which in most cases meant they were widowed there are a few exceptions to this uh, the main one i'm thinking of there was a female physician who had her own listing separate from her husband which was pretty cool this was uh, i believe in the 1890s don't remember off the top of my head but that's a rare exception most women if they're listed by themselves they're usually widowed in the night starting in the 1930s married women would be included in in their husband's entries, their first names would be in parentheses next to their husband's names. And then start, and then sometimes later on, you could tell it would be if their husband died, they would be listed on their own, but it would say in their widow of whatever their husband's name was. And then it wasn't until the 1950s that all adult women, regardless of marital status, were listed under their own names. So you have to, it's relatively recent that you're going to be able to find women. Uh, the other exception, which Penelope is reminding me. So yes, women teachers will be listed in, uh, in some sections. The other place where you can find women in the city directors would be in the business listings in the back. So if they had a job, so there's going to, so if they were a physician, they would be listed with the physicians. If they were a seamstress, they would be listed with them. If they owned or operated any kind of business, like a grocery store, a restaurant, or really anything, they would be in the business listings. If they were the owners of a business or if they were in one of the professions where people were listed individually and teachers are part of that and also physicians. So that is in some cases, that could be the only place where you would find a woman in a city directory. That would, of course, only generally list where she worked. It wouldn't tell you where she lived. So that's something to keep in mind. Other thing to keep in mind is that children were not listed at all. So you're not going to, if you're looking for where a particular child lived, you're not going to find them. You would need to look for the names of the adults that they were living with. So if that was their parents or a guardian or someone else, you'd have to look for them and not the child themselves. Children in general, the only records they'll be listed in like these will be the census records. So they're not gonna be in really any of the resources we're gonna talk about tonight. So this is specific for the Boston City Directory. I'm not gonna go through all of these. I'm just gonna point out a couple of them. So 1789 was the first year. It was published. It was published regularly early on. There wasn't one every year. The first year people of color were listed was in 1813. And from that point to the 1848, 1849 issue, they were listed in their own section. That was, so there was a separate section at the end of the general section where people of color were listed. Uh, Okay, and yeah, so here we go. So this just shows you when the different towns were annexed. Prior to when these neighborhoods were annexed, when they're separate towns, they're gonna have their own directories. They're not gonna be included in the Boston directory. So that's something else to keep in mind. So for instance, if you have someone you're researching who lived in Dorchester prior to 1870, when it was annexed, you need to find, you need to find the Dorchester directories. They won't be in the Boston directory they might be in the boston directory if they worked in boston proper but they're and they would say in that case lived in dorchester but it wouldn't tell you where they lived because dorchester was a separate place back then so that's true for all of the neighborhoods of boston that used to be separate towns another big thing is in 1930 that is the first year that there was a, an added listing organized by address. Up until that point, it was organized alphabetically by last name only. 
So if you only knew where a person lived, you're not going to be able to find them. It, you could find them if you were to look through every single entry or find a really good digitized copy that's indexed, but otherwise you're not going to find them by address until 1930. And in 1933, that's the first year that the women are in parentheses with their husband's names. Okay, and the uh, the physical copies that the BPL has, it, was, it ceased publication in 1981. That is primarily because phone books were more regularly published back then. So people were just using those and the city directory wasn't really considered to be all that important anymore. So that's when it stopped publishing was in 1981. So what the BPL has, is a large collection of city directories on microfilm and also in hard copy. And you can request those from the research services desk, which is located on the second floor of the central library in Copley Square. We also have a collection of city directories from other places aside from Boston. You can see more of what we have. And again, all of these links are gonna be in your handout and you'll also be getting the slides for this later. So if you go at go to look at the city directory section of the directories research guide, you can see first of all where all the a listing of the Massachusetts city city of all the Massachusetts directories that we have. So the alphabetical by town, you can see what years we have. Some of these are online. You can also over here, there's a list of every single one that we have. So we have a at some point in our previous in previous years, we bought this gigantic set of city directories. So we have city directories from all over the country, and they are organized alphabetically. So you can see here what you know it'll tell you what the place is and the years that we have. So we have quite a few. This uh, thing is several hundred pages long as you can tell here so we have quite a few so even if you're looking for somewhere outside of Boston there's a definite possibility that we'll have it however it is more limited the years that we have for other places that are not Boston particularly for smaller towns so you can see here for this town in Oregon we only have 1921 uh, for Augusta though which is a little bigger we do have more years so we're in general going to have more for the bigger towns. And this is also an example of what I showed you. Sometimes they'll cover multiple places. So for instance, here, Auburn, Rhode Island is a very small town in the Providence area. It's with the Cranston directory. Cranston was slightly, was bigger than, was a part of the same directory with Auburn because they're both pretty small towns. So they're not gonna, neither of them are gonna have their own directory. And I point that out only because I have family in Cranston. So I think that's pretty interesting that we have them. Okay. So you can find some of these online. So a lot of them, the probably if the easiest place to look at them, if you want to do a search would be in Ancestry Library Edition. That is a database that the BPL subscribes to. You can only use it at a BPL location, but you can use it at any BPL location. So you don't have to come to the central library. You can go to any branch that you might live near. And if you're visiting uh, he, us from other places, if you check with your local library, chances are they have it. It's a very popular resource. A lot of libraries all over the country have it. So if you wanna look for city directories, just click on the search page and over here, under the schools directories and search histories, you can see uh, the city and area directories. So you will just click on over here. All right, it's gonna take a little while there. Okay. So what I would suggest is you click on match all terms exactly. So let's say for instance, I want to look for someone named John Devine who lived in Boston. And let's say, so if you wanna look for a particular, you could just look for that to see what happened. So if you wanna see where a person was living in various times, you can trace it that way. So there's, there's gonna be more than one person by that name. So there's a lot of listings, but if you wanna limit it to a particular year, you can go to the any event fields and limit it. So let's say I wanted to look for 1923. 
and click search. And there we go. So what we can do, you can click on this here. It'll show you a transcript of the basic information. I always like looking at the image. You can look at a, an image of the scanned page here. So if you click on that, let's just see if we can zoom in. There we go. So, and here we are. So, so this here will have, I'm not sh quite sure what this asterisk means, I apologize. So it'll have the person's name and where they lived. In some cases you can see here, uh, let me see if I can find an example. So these are just telling you where they lived. Okay, what is this? Uh, this might be a business listing. Let me just make sure. No, yes. Yeah, so this is the so, okay. So this is a listing of lawyers. So this is where their practices are. So that's something else you got to keep an eye on. Sometimes it'll. This is the tricky thing about ancestry. It's sometimes in some volumes they only have the business listings. So this is where their offices were that they practiced at. Let's see if I can get you a regular listing so you can see what they look like. Okay, so let's okay, let's get rid of the years. Let's see if I can find a regular residential listing. So that's C. Let's okay, there we go. That should do it. Okay, so this is from 1951. So this is one of the newer ones. So it's going to look a little different. It's going to have ads along the top and the side. So this is the residential listing. If you zoom in here, see? And there we go. Okay, so here's all the John Devine. So there we go. So you can see here, like with this person, you can see uh, there, there's his wife's name, these two in parentheses. So you know now what their wives' names were. It'll tell you what their occupations were. So this particular person was an operator on the MTA. So that tells you what he did and where he worked. And home was in Rock. So he lived at Five Marshfield in Roxbury. Sometimes it'll tell you where they worked and as well as where they lived and looks like they're not doing that here. So most, so at this point, they're just telling you where they live. So here's one example of someone who works in Boston, but lives elsewhere. So this person, Joseph C. Devine, whose wife's name is Helen, he worked at the First National Bank of Boston, but it says here home was in Dover. So he worked in Boston, but lived in Dover. So this is all, this can also be a useful resource if you're looking for someone who just worked in Boston and didn't live here, their information will still be in here because they worked at some place that was in Boston. So they're gonna be listed in here. So that's just one place to look at. So there's a bunch of other places that have digitized these. I will say though, it's there isn't one place where all of them will be. It's kind of a mix. So uh, we're not gonna look at all of these. So the other thing you, the other place you can look at city directories if you're not at the library is Heritage Quest. This is something you can get to from home. I like to call it Ancestry Light. That's because as you can see here, it looks almost the same as Ancestry. It's run by the same company, has a lot of the same resources, and that includes a city directory. So here, you just click on that link right there. And then the search function is exactly the same as it was on Ancestry. So this is one that you can use from home. So this is so these are places where you can get anything that's not just Boston. So like, like I said, we're not going to look at all of these because we have a lot to go over. So those are the databases that have them. These are the different websites that have them scanned online. So the, the caveat with these is you can't do a search by name like you can in the databases. You would just have to look at each page to see where the person is. So the best one I think is there's a, the Boston Athenaeum has digitized every single Boston directory from 1789 to 1900. Their focus was the 19th century primarily. So you can go to their website here 
So you click on their link to catalog records here. So let's say I want to look at something in this time range. Okay, so now you can just click on the link here. They put everything up into the Internet Archive. So let's say I want to look at 1885. You can just click on that there. And it'll open it right up in the Internet Archive, which is, again, a free resource. Let's make this a little bigger here. But there is a search function in Internet Archive. It is somewhat limited. It doesn't work quite as well as the database does. This is also interesting. It's a, it is a little easier, easier to navigate if you're looking page by page than it is in Ancestry. So there's a bunch of different reasons why you might want to use each one. But let's just click on a random page. There we go. Again, this is 1885. You can see here it does look a little bit different than the 1950s. You can see when you, if you look here, there's not going to be a little a lot of women, but as you can see here, as uh, someone already pointed out, there sometimes are teachers listed. So here we have uh, Sarah A. Jordan, who was a teacher. So this is basically how it would look back then. And you can see a lot, you know, let's take it. So this person first, uh, for instance, okay. So this person was a clerk and he worked at 25 Vale, but he lived at 8 Alston Street, in Charlestown. That's the brief. So CHSN is the abbreviation for Charlestown and says B, that means he was a boarder. So he was a boarder in Charlestown. There is a list of what all the abbreviations mean at the front. I've just been looking at these so long, I know what all the abbreviations mean. You can see here there's WR for West Roxbury, ROX for Roxbury, EB for East Boston, and so on and so forth. So there, so those are, that's one place that's from the Boston Anthenium. There's a bunch of other places that have them. It is primarily the Internet Archive where they'll be listed at. So there's, there are other city directories online. Um, in a lot of cases, if you just Google the name of a place and city directory, chances are you might be able to find a few of these online, but there have been some digitized by other places, for instance, the New York Public Library has digitized New York City directories from 1786 to 1923. Uh, the New York Public Library has a very robust digital collection online. So if you want to look at that, let's say we want to look at this one here. And you could just, uh, let me see, uh, their interface is a little tricky. So you have to, there we go. So you click on each page in order to look at it. You click over here to zoom. Uh, it's not the most intuitive site. And there we go. So another really interesting thing about the city directories is a lot of them will have like little mini, especially the older ones, they'll have little mini almanacs at the beginning with information about the weather and various things. And a lot of them will also have information about government officers, uh, stagecoach schedules and things like that. So these are, can also be good for researching things other than people. I said there, there we go. So this one, as you can see, it looks pretty much like the early one from Boston. This thing is really not behaving for me today. There we go. So it's just a basic list of names, occupations, and where they lived. So that is New York. There's also the Philadelphia Museum of Art has some from Philadelphia. The University of Maryland has digitized some from Baltimore. And the University of Pennsylvania has some for Washington, DC. But again, like I said, if you just go into Google, do a search for city directory in the name of a place, or if you go to the library catalog of a library that you're looking at and look to see what city directories they might have, city directories are a very important resource. And most bigger metropolitan libraries will have them. So now we're going to move on to society directories. This here is a cover for Who's Who along the North Shore for 1912. I thought that was a lovely fancy border, so I put that one in there. So society directories, again, like city directories, they are commercially published listings. These are not produced by the government. And they. the other thing about these is they will only have the wealthiest residents of a city or town. So these are really helpful if you're looking for more prominent citizens or if you have ancestors you're looking for who 
had money or were important to a place. So the two main things we're going to be looking at for society directories are the social register, which is still in publication today, and the blue books. So good things to know about society directories, they were heavily biased. So they would exclude certain sections of the population, sometimes based on race or religion or other differences. For example, the mayor of Boston, one of the mayors of Boston in the early 20th century, John Fitzgerald, who is the maternal grandfather of John Kennedy, was not in the social register because he was Irish Catholic. However, he was in the blue book which was a little bit more inclusive, at least in that regard. The other thing to keep in mind in society directories, a lot of them would shorten the names to initials. So for instance, someone named Joseph Michael Smith might be in there as Mr. J.M. Smith. Their married women would also be listed under their husband's name. So for instance, there would be Mrs. John M. John M. Smith, Mrs. J.M. Smith, one and so forth. Unmarried women will be listed under Miss, so there would be like Miss Jane Smith. So, and depending on the directory, these listings could be organized by address, alphabetically by last name, or sometimes both. So, depending on the directory, you might get one or the other or both. So, for the Boston Blue Book, this is what they looked like, and these are fairly small books. This is almost a life size image here, they're not very big. So the Clark's Boston Blue Book, which is its full title, it included residents who lived in selected districts. So it's not going to list people who lived all over the city, regard, even if they were wealthy, they only were really looking at the fashionable places to live. The early volumes, they are organized by address, and then later volumes are by name. So, and also later volumes, they expanded a bit to include people in Brooklyn, Cambridge, Chestnut Hill, and Milton. So the BPL has them in hard copy from 1876 to 1937. If you do want to look at the hard copy, you can request that from the research services desk. They are also available online. You can see these here, so we're just going to take a look at this one. There we go. So these are also, they're going to have some ads, a lot like the city directory. So like I said, this is when it's organized geographically. So if you're looking for something, if you know where someone lived during this time period, you could, you could just go right to where they lived. They're also going to list people who lived in the hotels. So let's just go to a random page here. There we go. It is a little bigger. So as you can see here, there's Miss M. Russell, Louisburg Square. And then like, like I was telling you, pretty much everyone in here is listed under their initials only with very few exceptions. So a lot of initials here. So you can see uh, Mr. and Mrs. H.W. Savage, Mr. and Mrs. Sabin. And th these two folks here lived at the Langham, so that would have been a hotel. And it's a, I just find these very fascinating. The other things they will have in here, they don't have it in this particular year, but some editions will also have any, so any clubs that they belonged to. So you can also look at them to figure that out and see that could be open up another avenue of research for you. And I messed up that link. So those can open up another avenue of research for you. You could see if you could track down the records of any social clubs your ancestors were in, and that could give you even more information about what they were doing. So this image here on the right is one of the things that show, uh, this is uh, the Boston uh, Blue Book again. This shows the, so this is the West End and Clarendon Street and a little bit of Com Ave. So you can kind of see who was living around there back then. So now the social register, which again is still published, it began in publishing in 1887 and back then it only really just covered the New York City. This was during the Gilded Age, so it covered basically the upper upper crust of New York City. It did very quickly though expand to other cities, so they published different editions and it was primarily in the Northeast, although it did expand a little bit West. I believe there's Chicago volumes somewhere. 
these began being published in following years. Nowadays, there's just one social register to cover the whole country. It's not quite as popular as it once was. This is the title page from the Boston year, for, from Boston edition from 1901. So in 1977, everything was consolidated into one volume and that's what it is today. In, in earlier editions, married women would be listed under their husband's names with their maiden name in parentheses. You can see an example here from this Boston page. If you can look at uh, this first listing here, there's Mr. Mrs. Rogers L. Barstow Jr. And in here in parentheses, Rebecca Newbold. So that will tell you what Mrs. L. Mrs. Rogers L. Barstow Jr.'s maiden name was. And now we have her first name. So she's not just listed under her husband's name. So this can actually be a pretty useful resource. These other abbreviations in through here, they'll tell you where they graduate, uh, when they graduated. So this fellow here graduated from Harvard in 1871. They will also list, uh, I believe, I'm not sure if this one has so, so cl social clubs they were in. I think this one just lists colleges. And this one in particular, John Washburn Bartle, he probably married, he apparently got married that year. So as it tells you when he got married, that he got married in Dublin, New Hampshire to a Miss Charlotte Hemingway. So that tells you when they got married. So you can find all sorts of random information in here, including where they went to college, social clubs, and even when they got married. So eventually, if you, once you get later on into later volumes, they would include the names, they would include this information for everyone, their names, dresses, educational information, even for the women, and social club memberships. So what we have here at the BPL, we have in hard copy with gaps, 1890 to 1976 for the Boston edition. I will tell you uh, the older, the really old ones are in kind of sorry shape and some of them are only partial volumes. They were really well used and uh, they used to be in a public shelf and they got used quite a bit and there's big chunks of them missing the earlier ones, which is why we usually will refer folks to the online edition. And then we also have 1977 to the present of the national one. And you can request these again at the research services desk, but some of them are online. So this is Happy Trust. So if you look here, uh, some of them are under copyright because it is still an active publication. So you're not gonna be able to look at every single issue. You're mostly gonna be able to look at the older ones, but let's look at this one. So you can't really see it here, but it's a red printing on a black background. Those are what the covers look like. Okay, let's keep going here. So this is 1903. So this here will explain all the abbreviations of the different clubs people belonged to. So you could look at this key and then figure out what clubs they were in. So here we go. And here we go. So this is 1903. These are all the high. These are all the high society folks in the Boston area. And again, right here, you see Mr. J I believe that's short for James. I could be mistaken. So Mr. Elliot Cabot. This will tell you he died in Brookline on January 16th of that year. So you could even get a death date in here. Like I said, all sorts of random information that you can find in these society directors, which is why I keep pushing them because not a lot of people know how just how useful they are. So we do have other, there are other society directories for places in Massachusetts. Cambridge had its own set of blue books as did Newton, the North Shore. The North Shore also had the Who's Who, which was a different publication. And there's also Online is an 1889 volume for Springfield, which I'm from Western Mass, so I got a big kick out of that when I found out that that existed. Because you don't, those of you who are from, you know, who are from Massachusetts, it's, well, it's, I found it very interesting that there was one of these for Springfield. I thought that was pretty, pretty cool. 
Then there are also some, uh, so these are just some other directories. These are things that were published all over the country. There were even a few national ones prior to the social register publishing their national volumes. There's a few that are called, there's one that I thought was interesting called the 469 Ultra Fashionables of America in 1912. This is kind of an odd duck. As far as I know, this is the only one of those volume the only one of these that were ever done is so far as I know I haven't been able to find any others so you can see here in the table of contents they have folks that live in Philadelphia Baltimore Boston Providence San Francisco and Newport Newport obviously for those of you who are familiar with the history of Newport that would be a pretty big deal so let's look at something random here we go so let's see Okay, so this is New York and New there we go. We we're just talking about New York and Newport. So this is the 300. So these would have been the ultra elite in New York City and the people who summered in Newport. That's does it doesn't have a ton of information though. It just really will have their names and maybe if you look here, there'll be there's some writing about some of the fabulous places that they lived. So there's a few others. There's uh, links to the New York Social Register, the New York edition of the Social Register, <clears throat> excuse me, as well as Philadelphia, Wilmington, and Washington, D.C. Again, this is a lot like the city directories. If you just do a, a Google search or search in a library catalog for the name of a place and a social register, and a and you say social register or blue book or something like that, you might be able to find something. A lot of these have been digitized. So those are the social directories. Now we're going to go on to other directories. So this here is the title page for uh, a phone book from 1901. Believe it or not, there were phones back then. There weren't a ton of them, but they did exist. So that's so we do have phone books for that time period. So this is for New England. So it says here, all principal points in New England and states east of the Mississippi River. So there were so few phone books back then they could include a large swath of the country and one volume. So what we have here at the BPL, we have a huge collection that are primarily in microfilm or microfiche. There's a, we have a big, huge cabinet full of these. So you can see an example of them here on the right. I forget what year this is from, but it's one of the older ones. You can see here, this is before we moved to a, the, to the current phone number system. So this is a pretty old one. And this one will list, this one lists uh, Boston Public Library, which is why I, Put it in here. You can see here that was our phone number. We are, our phone number was Back Bay 604. I think this is 1898. I'm not 100% sure. So we have so many telephone directories. We have a whole section of this in one of our research guides. So you can see here uh, list, you know, links to things that we have online. So this will tell you more about what we call phone fiche. This will tell you what places we have them for. So we have this set that covers a lot of the country. It is mostly going to be the bigger cities, a few other places put in there. And this uh, directory here will explain everything. Um, Boston, we have the phone books on the microphone, ah, 1884. So for Boston, we have a microphone from 1884 to 2001. We do still have some in hard copy. Um, I don't know the most recent one we have. We try to keep phone books in here, but folks tend to walk off with them. So it's been a little hard to keep them in the building, but we do have a lot of phone books. These can be really, really useful. We have folks using these a lot of the time to research uh, where business was as well. They can also be useful for that. So and this is a resource that goes back pretty far, probably a lot farther in time than a lot of folks might think. And this is the other big one. I could probably do an entire class just on this. That's how interested I am in it. So these are the lists of residents. The BPL has a collection of them covering from 1909 to 2014. Uh, that 1909, there are some gaps. We weren't getting it regularly back then, so we don't have a complete collection. 
as a lot of them are available online. We're going to take a look at that, that it is a very important resource. So these, as you can see in this guide here, they were organized only by address until 1984. So up until 1984, you will need to know where the person you're researching lived in order to find them in here. And they are further organized by ward and precinct. So you will need to look at the street lists. We've digitized those as well and put them up. We'll need to look at the street list to see where a person lived, what ward and precinct their address was on. So we're going to take a look. So you can see here, uh, we've marked what would be good to look at for years. The ward and precinct lines were redrawn quite a bit uh, in, the in the 19th and 20th centuries. So it is something you definitely need to know. You can't just find it for one year and say, okay, that's where they were the whole time because it could very well have changed the very next year. That's something that you would need to look at. So I can show you here. So like I said, there are some gaps where we don't have an entire set for 1909 and we don't have anything. Uh, let's see, we have 1909, 1910. So 19, yeah, again, it's very, very spotty. We do not have complete sets for a lot of these, but we do start getting them pretty regularly from 1922 onwards. We have primarily most of them. So let's take a look at this one just randomly. You can, <coughs> excuse me. All right, so you can see here, it's organized by Ward and Precinct. So this is Ward 9, Precinct 1. So this list lists residents of 20 years of age and over. Uh, what's important to note here is these are vote uh, draw, drawn primarily from voter registration rules. So women will not be included in here until 1921. So that's something to keep in mind. And again, children are not going to be included in this. So as it says here, uh, women are going to be indicated by a dagger and veterans likely of World War I will be indicated by a star. So let's make this a little bit bigger. Okay, so here, so it is organized alphabetically by street and then by house number according to the warden precinct. So this is 49A Street. So this tells you what their application, what their occupation was, how old they were. And the other cool thing, it tells you where they lived the previous year. So let's find a, an example. Let's see, okay, so you can see here, uh, Mary and Michael Murphy lived at 79 A Street the previous year. And you can see here, Timothy Vaughn lived in Vermont the previous year. So this can be a good way to trace people backwards. If you find someone in a more recent directory, you can go back and back and back to see where they lived. But again, these are things that you are gonna have for other places. which we have. So we have places, it's primarily for cities and towns in Massachusetts. It's a limited collection. So we're not gonna have a complete run of thing of list of residents for other places. So the best thing to do if you're looking for a place of Massachusetts, uh, send us an email and ask to see if we have it. This particular page here is from Middleborough, uh, I believe from 1923. So you can see it's laid out pretty similar, similarly. It's by address. And it has the house number, the name, their age, and their occupation, and where they lived the previous year. And in this case, it actually tells you what their national origin is. So you can see here, there's a few Lithuanian immigrants and one Polish immigrant here. So that can also be pretty interesting. It's going to vary depending on the place that you're looking at. All right, so that was the end of my presentation. So I can take questions now. I think we have a couple in here already. So let's take a look. Okay. Yeah, lots of people. Okay. Uh, let's Okay, so Penelope's asking, is there a way to tell what month the directory was published for a part-time or seasonal resident? So what will it will say when it was published? Um, it usually will have the publication 
date. So for instance, it would say something, a lot of these are published in April. So it'd say as of April, whatever. So it will tell you when it was published. So if we go back, get back here. So if you go back to the city directories, you can see here, it says reported residents as of April 1st, 1922. So on, that's where they were living on that date. So it will tell you that it's not, I don't believe it's not going to tell you seasonal residences. I don't think it would have to, I believe they only listed permanent residents. Get back here. Okay. Okay, so let's see. And so Eileen's asking where the Hyde Park, so I think you're asking about where Hyde Park records prior to 1912 are. So they're still going to be with the city of Boston because it's part of the city of Boston now, but they're going to be in separate volumes. They're not going to be with the Boston volumes. And I think we have, we do have some of those. They Those haven't been digitized so far as I know, but let me just see here. Let's see what we can find. There we go. Okay. Okay. So yeah, so we do have those. So that's definitely something, yeah, just send us an email and we can tell you which ones we have. I don't think it's, they've all been cataloged. Oh, so this one has been digitized. This is from 1897, I think. So yeah, they are, like I said, we will still have them for the towns outside of Boston. It's just, they're gonna be their own directories. It's, they're not gonna be the Boston directory. That was the main point there is that you'd have to look in a different publication, not the regular Boston directory. So again, you need to keep that in mind when the neighborhood you're looking at was annexed. And it would also be true if you're looking at New York City directories, you'd have to, before uh, everything was just New York City, you'd have to look at the Brook, a separate Brooklyn directory, a separate directory for the Bronx and so on and so forth. They're all gonna be in their own, they're all gonna have their own records before everything was merged. Let's see, did I miss anything? Okay. All right. So if no one has any more questions, well, we'll be, I have we have some time, so I can wait a little bit for folks. Okay. So oh. Okay. Oh, this is cool. So, okay. So Penelope is saying, I found my great grandfather baseball player in his temporary lodging in Springfield because he arrived before April season began in the 1878 directory. Okay. So I guess they did include seasonal ones. So that's interesting. So that's good to know. So if you know someone who had the association with the place, they might be in there. Okay. So while we're waiting to see if anyone has more questions, it's going to promote our next event. So our next family history lecture is coming up in a few weeks. We have a guest speaker, Catherine Caldus, talking about researching your revolutionary war ancestors. So if that's something you're researching as well, she's a wonderful speaker, very enthusiastic. It's a, I've seen her presentation elsewhere. It's a wonderful presentation. So if that's something you're at all interested in, definitely register for that. There are plenty of spots open. And my next class will be on June 22nd, talking about using school records to research your ancestors. So definitely take a look at that if you're interested. Okay, well, okay, let's see. Okay, let's see. So Lillian's asking, how about poor houses? Is there an index I can look for? So that's going to be slightly different. Yeah, poor house records are, can be a little tricky. It depends on who was running them. If they were government run institutions, um, the city archives would probably have those records. If it was run by something like a church, you'd want to contact the church. If it was a charitable organization, what you can do is look for to see where their archives might be. So again, it really kind of depends. It's a little different than the sorts of things we're talking about tonight, but 
some of those records might be out there. They're just not going to be one place that they're at because they were run by different types of organizations. But you can always uh, just send us an email if any questions like that, and we will do our best to figure out where you need to go. Some very people, so you're all saying some very nice things in the chat. I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. So again, if you think of anything you wanted to ask but didn't get a chance to or whatever, you can send us an email to ask at bpl.org. We're also available by phone. Oh, this is a little, uh, oh, that's a little, oh, that is wrong. No, I forgot to change that. Okay, so I'm going to have to fix that before I send that to you all. <laughs> so we're available by phone Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. And we do also have a live chat Monday through Friday from 11 to 1, from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. We have a live chat. So definitely uh, take advantage of that. Okay, let me see. Uh, okay, let me see. Okay, so Cheryl's asking, do any of the directories list marriages? I can't track one down that took place in Boston. So like uh, we did see in one, a couple of examples here, some of them will list marriages. So the social director, so I think it was the social register or the clerks, they will occasionally list marriages. The city directories aren't going to list marriages. So that's something, that's the sort of thing, it's, it might pop up randomly, but that's really only going to be in society directories. So that's for the wealthy and prominent people. If you're looking for more of an ordinary person, that's really not going to show up in the directories. It's, that's more something you would have to uh try to track down um i don't know where you've been but so if it was something that took place in boston this the registry division at city hall should have a record of that otherwise if it was something that was part of a church you could contact the church where it might have happened and see what records they have so those are that's those are a couple of avenues you can go down Okay, then you're all, you're all being very, very nice. Like we, I, librarians do like to hear when they're doing our job. We, when, we do like to hear when we're doing our jobs well. So it's very nice. You're all very sweet. Okay. Um, okay, so if no one has anything else, we're gonna go ahead and wrap off. Once again, um, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Um, I hope you all enjoyed it. Uh, again, definitely feel free to reach out via email, phone, or chat if you have any more questions either about this or any other genealogy questions in general. Uh, if you send an email to askitbpl.org. That's the best place to go. If you have any questions specifically about the presentation, like if a, the link isn't working for you or something like that, you can email me. My con, you know, you'll have my contact email in the wrap up in email tomorrow. So in the wrap up email tomorrow, everyone will be getting a link to the handout in case you missed it, and also to my slides, which I'm gonna fix right now. And also, this was recorded, so everyone will be getting a, a link to the recording once it is ready. Hopefully, fingers crossed tomorrow, but more likely sometime next week, because again, our AV people are wonderful and they're very, very busy. So they'll get, you know, it might take a few days. So once again, thank you everyone for coming and I hope everyone has a good night.